right, good morning. We're glad to have you today. I am going to lead a congregational song, and I hope you'll sing with us. I just wanted to make note of the beautiful new decorations. What do you think? Our window coverings, aren't they beautiful? This, this, yeah, no, that's so you can see the chalk talk. It'll be very dark in here, and he's not even going to do it in the Sunday school hour. Morning service? Not till tonight, so you got to come back and see how dark it will be. It'll be, uh, it'll be dark when we turn the lights off, but we won't see that this morning. So we're gonna, really glad to have Barry and Cheryl Webb. Cheryl is going to be playing the piano for everything all week except for the invitation. And, uh, of course, we've got the chalks, chalk talks we mentioned to you back there. They did that years ago, and he came today and said that the last time he was here and did that, it was 21 years ago. So it's been a while. Uh, we'll see that tonight, and puppets, I think, some this morning, so that'll kind of kind of whet your appetite, and uh, then I think you will dismiss the children at the right time, so that'll be great, and that'll go back to the children's church room. We're going to begin by singing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. It's number, what number is it? 459. Let's stand together as we sing. Take a hymn home if you need it. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. together and we'll pray and brother Andrew would you lead us in prayer please amen thank you Andrew go ahead and have a seat and brother Webb well, good morning. It's good to see each one of you here this morning on uh, this first service of our special meetings. You can tell the folks who missed Sunday school this morning, they missed the puppets for today. Oh, there's a good reason to be at every service of your local church so you don't miss any of the special things that are going to be going on. Uh, as Pastor mentioned, the platform is a little different than what it normally does. Uh, in tonight, uh, tonight's service, as well as Tuesday night and Thursday night, we'll be having chalk art drawings on the chalkboard there and if you've never seen one of those done before in about 15 minutes I'll draw a picture in the service this evening with music and story in the background and colored light and black light effects on the drawing as well and I'm sure it'll be a blessing to you so you want to be sure to be here and don't miss out on that no they aren't trying to change religions to Jehovah's Witness or something where they don't have any windows in the uh, auditorium that way but we're glad that uh, they have got those uh, cu cut down uh, so that it's uh, uh, the, the darker it is in the auditorium, the better the lights run on the chalk drawing. So uh, you don't want to miss that. That'll be in the evening service tonight. And in just a moment, we're going to be going over to the Puppet Castle. Uh, there are over 20 puppets who live there. Uh, we'll meet some of them this morning and uh, some more as we go through the week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night. They'll be with us in our special meeting. So uh, just kind of remember, every other night we alternate back and forth between doing the chalk and doing the puppets. 
And uh, then Mrs. Webb will be having a class. That's my wife over behind the piano. She'll be doing a class uh, every night during the preaching time for those who are third grade and under. Uh, we'll be going back with her for a, a special class uh, every night during that time, uh, during the preaching time. So uh, that's uh, something you let folks know about as well. Uh, lots of things taking place here. We'll be doing special music. Cheryl and I will be singing together. She'll be playing the piano. I have horns, but I'm not a bull. There are four brass instruments that we carry along with us right now. I have a euphonium. That's the largest horn I play. There's a trombone. That'll be easily recognizable. There's a fluga bone I'll be playing in the morning service at the offertory time. That's a trombone with a slide taken off and valves put on instead. So I guess if you're in the marching band, you don't have to worry about hitting the fellow on the row and funny in the back of his head with your slide. But uh, I bought it to take overseas. That's the one horn that I can carry as a carry-on overseas and use there as well as here in the United States. And then I have this horn. It looks like a uh, trumpet with a thyroid problem. <laughs> That's because it's, uh, it's a trumpet with a thyroid problem. It's called a bass trumpet. My father was an evangelist, preached the gospel for uh, 67 years, and uh, he started out with a baritone horn and then traded that in and bought uh, this bass trumpet. So he's with the Lord right now. He, I'm sure he's got better instruments up there to play. And I'm keeping his horn busy down here as long as we can as well. I want to begin this morning with a song that talks about uh, what, the, what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 1. He knew. He said he knew three things. Number one, he knew his Savior, that his Savior was the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew his salvation, that it wasn't by his works, but by faith in the finished work of Christ. And he knew his security. He said in 2 Timothy 1 verse 12, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. the same three things the Apostle Paul knew. They all can apply to your life as well today if you know Christ as your personal Savior. Well, as I mentioned a moment ago, we are going to be going over to the Puppet Castle, so I'll introduce my wife, Cheryl. She'll see if she can find somebody awake in a home. Now, the, I always think it's interesting. The adults come in and they say, oh, puppets, the children will really like this. And then I hear more laughter out of the adults than I do out of the kids, which is fine. You'll find the puppets aren't just for the kids. They're for everybody else. And while they may be entertaining, they always have an important Bible lesson that they're teaching as well. So without any further ado, we'll see if Miss Webb can find somebody there in the castle that might have a story for us this morning. Okay, let me just give a knock on the wall. We'll see if we can wake somebody up in here this morning. Sometimes it's early Sunday morning, they're still sleeping in bed. Wake up. Oh, here comes someone. Who is that? <laughs> oh. Well, 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 well. If it isn't Mrs. Webfoot. How are you doing, Mrs. Webfoot? My name is not Webfoot. Sure it is. You have web feet, don't you? No, I don't. Yes, you're married, married to a web, aren't you? Yes. Your last name's Webb, isn't it? Yes. Then you have web feet. <laughs> I better explain who this is. Yes, why don't you do that? Some of these people have not had the privilege of meeting me yet. Oh, they've been lucky enough not to have met you that's yet. That's just your opinion, Mrs. Webfoot. Anyway, this is Mr. Evil. That's right, that's right, that's right. Mr. Evil is one of Satan's helpers. And that's right, too. And this is Mrs. Webfoot. She's one of the goody two-shoes here for 
whatever it is you're here for this week. What are you doing here this morning? What am I doing here? What are all these people doing here this morning, huh? We're here for Sunday school. Sunday school? Yes. No, no, don't you people know this is Sunday morning. You're supposed to stay home at Betty by Baptist with Pastor Sheets. <laughs> He's a good pastor. He's got you covered. <laughs> so why don't you make like a tree and leaf or put an egg in your shoe and beat it, will you? Or make like a good fundamental Bible preaching church and split, man. <laughs> You're terrible. Thank you. I do try. We need to get rid of him this no, morning. No, no, no. You can't get rid of me. I'm busy trying to get rid of all of you. So why don't you all go play on the freeway or something? Will you? Come on. Go, right, go, listen. go. There's one thing that Mr. Evil is afraid of. I'm not afraid of anything, Webfoot, particularly not you. Well, you are afraid of the Bible. Yuck! I hate the Bible. I don't mind when it lays around underneath a bunch of magazines and newspapers and gathers dust, but I hate when people read it and memorize it and quote it and it really bugs me when people get saved because of it. Well, we're going to see a Bible verse together this morning and scare you off. Ha, ha, ha. You don't think these people are going to help you, do you? Yes. Even if you do need lots of help. Upstairs. <laughs> All right, I think everyone here knows John 3.16. No, nobody here knows John 3.16. Yes, and if you used to know it, you have amnesia and you forgot it. No, they know it. Let's say this really loud together and we'll get rid of him. No, no, don't say anything. We're going to sit here and stare at Mrs. Webfoot. Make her feel really self-conscious, okay? That'll okay. be fun, okay? Let's stare at Mrs. Right. Webfoot. Are you here ready? We go. All right. Gonna stare. All right, here we go. Yeah, here we go. Gonna stare. John 3, 16. No, no, hey, 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 you don't have to speak to stare. No, no, don't, please, don't quote the Bible. Stop that. Uh, my master has to leave when you do that. I have to leave when you do that. But I'll get you for this. You'll see. I'll take care of you people. Life. Ooh, I'll get rid of you people later. You just wait. No, you just think so, Mr. Evil. I don't think so, Mr. Webfoot. I know so. <laughs> you think so. I know so. You think so. I know so. You think so. I know so. Well, I'm glad he's gone anyway. That's what you think. Oh, boy. All right, let me see if I can find somebody else. Whoa, it's a dragon. Well, of course it's a dragon. What do I look like to you, Snow White? No, you look like a dragon. That's good, that's because I am a dragon, Mrs. Webb. Uh, you must be Derwood the dragon. Yes, ma'am, Derwood dragon at your service. I'm glad to see you out here so bright and early this morning. Oh, it's morning. very nice to be able to be here. I really love coming to Sunday school. It's my favorite service of all the meetings of the week. Your favorite service? Yes, ma'am. It's the one opportunity I really have to be with some of my own kind. Be with some of your own kind? Sure, because after some people being up late last evening and then getting up early to come to Sunday school, well, everybody's dragon. Uh, so I thought I could be with some of the other dragons, you know what I mean? That's real nice, Derwood. Maybe between now and the morning, Cyrus, some more folks are dragon, too. <laughs> Maybe so. Yeah. We do have everyone here for Sunday school, though. Are oh, you? well, don't look at me, Mr. Webb. Uh, 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 what are you doing in Sunday school? We're, we're waiting for the story, are you? Oh, like I was going to say, uh, don't look at me. I don't tell them good Bible stories. By the time I get through with them, they get a little monotonous. Monotonous. Yeah, that too. So you do talk a little bit funny. Oh, no, I don't talk funny. I talk normal. Everybody else talks funny. Where are you from, anyway? Oh, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Oh, that explains Actually, it. I was born in North Jersey, but I moved to Brooklyn at a very early age. <laughs> Is that right? Oh, yes. The, the, the sewer I grew up in was lovely. Later, they renovated it and turned it into a subway. <laughs> oh, dear. Now I don't know which side of the tracks I live on. <laughs> So if you're not telling the story, maybe you'll see you later then, okay? Oh, well, I don't know about that because the rest of the services are going to be in the evenings after us, uh, this morning, right? Yes. Well, I make it a point not to come out in public in the evenings. You don't come out in the evenings? No, I'll be here in the castle, but I don't come out in public in the evenings because in the evenings, then it's nighttime, and you know what knights do to dragons. Oh, that's right. That would really slay me, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. So, I'll have to see you some other time, okay? Okay. Okay, have a very good Lord's Day, everybody. Thank Take you. care. Bye. See ya. Goodbye. Okay, well, I'm glad he stopped by to say hello, but we still do need somebody for the story. skibidi bop bop city skarata Skip, skip, dee, 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 pop. Hey, how are you doing today, Mr. Webb? Good, how are you? Doing very well, thank you. Nice to see you here this morning. Yes, Good to see you. everybody else that made it out for Sunday school. Yes, this is Big Al the Alligator. Right, Big Al the Alligator, the coolest alligator in the north, south, east, and west, and probably the only alligator in Hanover right now. <laughs> Wait a minute. 
coolest alligator? Right, that's because I'm green, man, and green is cool, man. Green is cool? That's right, anyone wearing green today is cool, man. Oh, we have a couple cool people here. But if you're not wearing green, you can still be cool. How's that? Stand in front of an air conditioner, man, you'll be oh. real cool. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you're here this morning. We have everyone for Sunday school. We're waiting for a story from the puppets. Oh, well, that's um, nice. Can I wait with you? You're not telling the story? No, no, no. I, I don't think so. Well, is anyone else coming? I don't know. And <laughs> going up step through the car, please. A top floor, please. Well, someone's coming on the elevator. <laughs> top floor. Thanks, bud. <laughs> Uh, Homer, ha. is that you? I hope so. I hate to think it was anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> Come on out. Stop that. That's my nose. Come on out, Stop Homer. it. Knock it off, will you? I mean, don't knock it off. That's my nose. Homer, come on out. Oh, I'd love to come out of here, Mrs. Webb, but this curtain thing is in my way here, and they don't put any instructions on the back of these things, you know. Homer, you just push through the curtain. What was that? She said push through the curtain. Well, I don't want to rip the thing, you know. Then go down a little lower. What was that? She said go down a little lower. Okay, how about this? Is this low enough? <laughs> Not in your voice, silly. I'm in a curtain. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, you mean like this? Yes, a little lower. Uh, a little lower. How about it? A little lower. Okay, how about it? A little lower. How about... Oh, Ow, woo, woo. <laughs> That's too low. I'll say that was pretty low of you guys. Ouch. <laughs> Get off me, you silly curtain. That's the to stop that. Get away from me. No, Homer's out here. Maybe he knows something about this story this morning. Oh, man, said, Web! What? I thought you said that would get me out of here. You are out here. Yes. I still say the same thing I thought before. <laughs> Homer, we're over here. Mrs. Webb, somebody's after me. Mrs. Webb, trying to get me to come out of here. Mrs. Webb. Yes, Homer. It's you. Yes. Why are you upside down? <laughs> oh, upside I was down. upside down. <laughs> oh, silly of me. How you doing, Mr. Webb? Good. How are good. you? Oh, hi, Big Al. Hey, how you doing, Homer? I'm done okay. Oh, good. It's nice to see you here. Uh, this, everyone, this is my good friend, Homer the Hound Dog. That's me, Homer the Hound Dog. <laughs> Glad to have you here this morning, Homer. Yeah. Oh, yes. Nice that nice, nice, nice weather out today. Yes. Two weeks ago, boy, when that storm was, that Ophelia came through. <laughs> yes. Oh. Yeah, it was raining cats and dogs. How did you know? I stepped in a poodle. <laughs> Okay, well, look, anyway, uh, Homer, Homer uh, you're, we're you're, waiting for a story from the puppets, Homer. Oh, oh, can I wait with you, too? You don't have the story, Homer? I don't think so. Well, wait a minute, Mrs. Webb. Don't you have a list? No, oh. she speaks perfectly okay. <laughs> Homer, I, I didn't Let's say see. lisp. I said a list. List. Oh, uh, yeah. Here's the list. Here's the you list. Got Let's one. see. Yes, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday school. Oh, look who it says. It does not say anything. You have to read it. Well, read it, Homer. Oh, don't show it to me, Mr. Oh. Webb. I don't know how to read. I haven't flunked obedience school. Uh-oh. Uh, look, let me see it, okay? Okay. Oh, look what it says as a story for today. Yes. Shall we spell it together? Okay. Okay. H-O-M-E-R. <laughs> hey, that's what real good, you guys. But if I can't read, I can't spell either. What's that spell? It spells Homer. Aha! Did you hear that, Big L? Yes, she said it spells Homer. <laughs> Isn't that the most ridiculous thing you ever heard? It spells Homer, Homer. Well, I know it can't spell Homer, Homer. It does not have that many letters. <laughs> Homer, it spells your name, and it means it's your turn for this story this morning. Oh, no. What? I forgot. You forgot? Well, you don't have to broadcast it all the way to Richmond or anything like that. Well, Homer, everybody is sitting here waiting for a story, and you mean to tell us you don't have one? I did not mean to tell you. You just dragged it out of me like you just did. No, no, no. Come on, Homer. Wait, wait a minute. I just remember one. I just remember one. Okay, good. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Goldilocks was walking to the woods one day when Homer... Oh, no, no, what? Homer. You can't tell that story. Well, of course I can't. If you interrupt me before I even get started with the thing. No, Homer, this is Sunday school. Yeah? And we always have a Bible story. What's wrong with the one I was telling? Homer, that was a fairy tale. A what? A fairy tale. 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 No, I have a doggy's tale, you guys. Not a fairy tale. <laughs> no, 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 Homer. The story you were telling was a fairy tale. No, don't you know any, any Bible stories? Bible stories, Bible stories. Let me think about it for a second, okay? Okay, but hurry up. Yes, okay. hurry. Whoa, whoa, Homer. What? What are you doing? I'm thinking that's the only way I can get anything through my sick head. Oh, well, hurry it up then. Okay. Oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. A story? No, a splitting headache. Oh. <laughs> but I got a story, too. It came with a headache. Well, that's good. What's the story going to be about? I think this morning we are going to tell a story about a shepherd. A shepherd? Yes, one who had 100 little sheepies. 100 little what? 100 little sheepies. Well, now, wait a minute, Homer. I've heard of sheep before, and I've heard of lambs, but never in my life did I ever hear of a sheepie. Oh, you poor depraved alligator, you. Don't you know what a sheepie is? 
No, how about you tell us all what a sheepy is? That's simple. A sheepy is a four-footed animal Footy. with woolly on its head, woolly, woolly. who says, batty, 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 batty. Homer, what you're talking about is a sheep, a four-footed animal with wool on his head who says, oh, you make a good sheep there, big Al. <laughs> Wonderful. Just go on with the story, okay? Okay, well, this shepherd was obviously trying to go to sleep. Trying to go to sleep? Yes, ma'am. He was counting sheep. Isn't that what you do when you're having trouble getting to sleep at night? No, 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 Homer. He, he was not counting imaginary sheep jumping over an imaginary fence so he could go to sleep. He was counting real live, she live sheep as they were coming into the fold at the end of the day to be sure that they were all there. Right. Oh, oh. Anyway, he was counting them like this. One little sheepy, two little sheepies, three little sheepies, four little sheepies, five little sheepies, six little sheepies, seven little sheepies, eight little sheepies, Homer. nine little sheepies. Homer, Homer, Homer. Don't, don't interrupt me, I'm counting sheepies. No, Homer, wait. We do not have time to wait for you to count a hundred sheep right now. We don't? No. no. Well, go out and get a cup of coffee and a donut and come back. I'll be done. No, 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 no Homer, we don't have time for that. Why don't you start from someplace like 97? 97. Yes. Let's see, well, I know where I-95 is, and I know where 295 is. No, 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 I don't mean highway numbers. I mean the number 97. Oh, oh and the number that you like when you're counting. Yes. Okay, let's see then. 97. Yeah, that's right. Uh, 97 little sheepies, 11 little sheepies, 12 little sheepies, 13 little Homer. sheepies. Homer, what are you doing now? I'm going back and picking up the ones I missed. Homer, don't do that. Pretend you've already counted all of those. Start from 97 and go on to 100. Oh, now you tell me. All right, go ahead then. Okay, let's see. Uh, 97. 97 little sheepies. Uh, 98 little sheepies. Um, uh, 99. Oh, thanks, I forgot. 99 little sheepies. Wah. Hey, hey, what? what? One of the sheepies is missing. What? One of the sheepies is missing. One of the oh. sheepies is missing. Well, quick, everybody look underneath your seat and see if there's a sheepie under there. Somebody go over across the other building and see if there's any sheepies. Somebody look under your seat. Look at back under the sample chart in the back of the auditorium. Maybe there's some um, under there. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold, 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 hold everything. We're trying to find the lost sheep, Homer. I know that, Mrs. Webb, but don't you know this story was told by Jesus almost 2,000 years ago? 2,000 years? ago yes then the poor sheeply's dead by now homer <laughs> will you just be quiet and listen to the rest of the story already okay go ahead well the shepherd loved all of his sheepies so much he could not bear to think of even one of them being lost so he left the 99 sheepies safe in the fold and he went out to look for that one lost sheepie uh-huh he looked high and he looked low he looked to the east and to the west or was it to the west and to the east? Anyway, anyway, he finally found those lost sheepy, and when he had found them, he picked him up, and he put him on his shoulder, and he carried him home, and he called all of his friends together, and he said, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheepy. That's a good story there, Homer. What's the Bible lesson? That's a good story, Mr. Webb. What's the Bible lesson? Homer, when you have the story, you're supposed to have the Bible lesson, too. I am? Yes. Oh, no. I forgot that, too. Look, Homer, there's a simple Bible lesson to that story. Aha, see, there was. What was it? You see, everybody here today is a sheep. No, I don't see woolly on their heads. No, Homer, I don't mean they're real sheep. But the Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him. That's Jesus, right? That's right. The iniquity of us all. You mean to tell me there might be a boy or a girl or a teenager or an adult here today who has never prayed and asked the Lord Jesus to come into their heart and to forgive them of their sins and to save them? That's right. And that means that they're lost today in their sin. And if they died, they would be separated and lost from God in a lake of fire for all of eternity. Yeah, but wait. In the story, there was that shepherd who loved the lost sheep until, and went out and sought him until he found him and brought him home. And the Bible tells us a more wonderful story, how that Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He came into the world to seek and to save those who were lost. He went to the cross of Calvary, and though he had never sinned, he died for everyone else's sin and paid for everyone else's sin. And God raised him from the dead, and the third day he rose dead from the grave. And he, because he's alive, he's able to give eternal life to any who will turn from their sins and trust what he did on the cross for them and even take his gift of eternal life. And then they don't have to be a lost sheepy anymore. Right. Right. They can be a found sheepy and live forever with the Lord Jesus in heaven. <gasps> well, I hope there's anybody here this morning who never has prayed and asked the Lord Jesus to come into their heart and to forgive their sins and to save them, that they would do that today. I hope so too. I hope so too. I hope so three. Do I hear four? Homer, four. never mind. Anyway. <laughs> hey, but there's a letter lesson in that story. Oh, what is it? The Lord Jesus Christ said, 
Other sheep have I which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. That's right. And there are others who do not know Christ yet as their Savior, and they need to be brought to Jesus too. And just a good week for folks to do that. If they don't know how to tell somebody how to be saved, they can bring them to the meetings, and Brother Webb will tell them how they can be saved. That's exactly right. And it could be maybe a neighbor or a classmate or a ball teammate or somebody else. A co-worker may come this week and put their trust in Christ, and then they can be a sheepy of God's too instead of a lost sheepy. Right. Very good. Yeah, well, it's been really good to see everybody here. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you some during the week this week, too. Lots of other puppet friends around the castle will be sharing stories. So we'll see you. Bye-bye. skibbity bop bop city t skada da skib skibbity bop Oh, and Mrs. Webb, when you have your class time, you always have a puppet friend back there, too, don't you? That's right. So even on the nights when Brother Webb, like tonight, is doing a chalk drawing tonight in the service, there won't be any puppets here in the puppet castle. Well, they'll be in the castle, but they're not coming out for a story tonight. And uh, uh, Mrs. Webb's class, from their third grade and down, there will be a, a, a puppet friend in, in yeah. her class uh, every night. Right. So All you right. can remember that as you invite people to come. Okay. Well, thanks for helping Homer, and we'll see you later, okay? Okay. Good. All right. Goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye, Mrs. Webb. Okay. Now it is time for our Sunday School message. And so right now... It's nice to see the McAvoy's again. Did you see the McAvoy? Yes, I did see the McAvoy. Yes, Pastor. Had, yes, it's been a long time since we were here because he's grown a beard. I don't and, think it and, took that long to grow the beard, All that though. kind of stuff that way. He, he was a young guy when we were here before, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's time for you to go. Okay? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. That we'll is see you later, fine. Homer. He looks very extinguished. Uh, dis distinguished. <laughs> yes. All right, Homer. We'll see you later, okay? okay All right, okay. goodbye. Yeah, goodbye. All right, now it is time for our Sunday School message. And so right now, Homer. Oh, yes, Ms. Evan. When you say goodbye, you're supposed to leave. <laughs> oh, well, why didn't you? <laughs> Not me, Homer, you. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I was supposed to leave. <laughs> All right. Oh, they leave me. Okay. Goodbye, All right, goodbye, goodbye, Homer. Goodbye, everybody. Okay, good. All right, now it is time for our Sunday School message. And so right now at this time, <sighs> Homer, is there a problem? Yes, ma'am. It's curtain thing. It's back in my way again here. Homer, you just back up to the window. Back the up same to the window. Way you made me oh, oh, like, oh, oh, no. whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I saw that. You're trying to give me the dog aside. You and me go splat down there. Homer, no, no, just back up. Back up like this? Yes, a little further. You know, like this? A little further. You know, there's a stairwell back here somewhere. Oh. <laughs> Ow. Oh. Homer? Yeah. Are you all right? Um, uh, I think so. Uh, no broken bones. Oh, bones. That reminds me, I did not have any breakfast yet. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that story this morning. It is time now for its, uh, our Sunday School message, also for the children to be dismissed for Sunday School. All right, so while the younger folks are heading out to their regular Sunday School classes with their teachers, everyone else can take your Bible and turn with me, if you would, to the second chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 2. So the puppets next time to be appointed here in the appointment in the puppet castle to share a story will be on Monday night. So put, mark that down on your calendar, Monday evening and then Wednesday and then Friday, the puppets will be with us. And the other nights are chalk drawing nights. And uh, what we like to do with the chalk drawings is this. We like to give all three of them away on the last night of our meetings this week to the three folks who brought the most visitors throughout our special meetings. Now, what is a visitor? A visitor is somebody who is not a regular attender of Hanover Baptist Church, but who came because you invited them to come. You can't just see somebody you don't know already headed for the door one night and say, would you be my visitor? It has to be somebody you got to come. They came because you invited them to be here. And uh, keep track of how many visitors you brought along with you. That way, because on Friday night, whoever's had the highest number of visitors from Sunday school all the way through Friday night will get their choice of the three chalk drawings that they'd like to take home with them. The second highest visitor bringer gets to choose from the two drawings that remain. And the third highest visitor bringer doesn't get a choice. They get stuck with the one nobody else wanted. But we give away all three of those drawings then on Friday night. So we keep that in mind as we come back to the services every night and be inviting and asking others to come be with you. And uh, after today, you'll have seen a lot of what we're going to be doing. And uh, so you ought to have uh, some to be able to tell other people about. Let me encourage you, use your social media websites if you can. Uh, I know we have folks that come, often have been able to get folks to come by taking a picture, say, of the chalk drawing and then posting it on their website and saying, the evangelist did this in 15 minutes in the service tonight. He's going to do another one on Tuesday night. So come and be with me. Come and see this take place or whatever else. Uh, let them know they're puppets. And, and it's all free. We're not charged anybody. You don't have to buy a ticket to come in and be here. Sometimes I wonder if we can get more people to come by selling tickets. Uh, for some people, the uh, reason some people think that if you have to buy something that that makes it better. But uh, in any case, uh, the gospel is free. And so we're sharing the word of God uh, with folks for free. So let me encourage you to be sure to be with us uh, for the special meetings 
uh, here this week and be inviting others that you can to come with you. In fact, that's what I want us to look at for just a few minutes this morning in our remainder of our Sunday School Hour. If you found your way to Mark chapter 2, if you're able, would you stand with me please in honor to the Word as I read our Scripture text for this morning's message. It says in verse 1, Mark chapter 2, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them, and they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let it down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason in these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say unto the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Let's remain standing for a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you this morning for the privilege we have to be here in your house and the opportunity we have to look into the Word of God. I pray that today you might undertake for the proclamation and the application of your Word into each heart present here and in the invitation bring about the decisions that will be pleasing in your sight tonight. We ask, Lord, that you would bless every aspect of the meetings throughout the week this week. And I pray that God's people be here, each one of the services, that they'll not be ill, won't be sick. And, Lord, they'll be able to be uh, faithful to be here with us. And that, Lord, they might be able to uh, invite friends and neighbors and others whose hearts I pray you would arrest and draw here to, to the services as well. And we'll thank you for what you'll be doing in hearts and in lives this week, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. I want to preach to you from our passage of Scripture and try to encourage you a bit about bringing others to the Lord this week. I want you to notice a number of things from our scripture passage we've just read. Notice first of all in verses 1 and 2, the packed house, the packed house. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house, and straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no not so much as about the door. Why was there in this passage of scripture such a packed house? Well notice uh, there are two things that caused that. First of all there was an announcement of Christ. The Lord Jesus came and went from the city of, of Capernaum uh, 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 back and forth in his ministry time for at least two and a half years. He stayed there many times, uh, had in a house there uh, as well, and uh, taught in the synagogue there in Capernaum. And Capernaum was on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. It was right on the route that led all the way from the African Rift, the Great African Rift, all the way up into Asia. There were always visitors coming through town. There were always business people, travelers going back and forth. And whenever the Lord Jesus Christ would return to Capernaum from being some other place, the people who knew him from before would go and tell everybody else, hey, you need to come. You need to hear this man preach. You need to hear what he's talking. It'll transform. It'll change your life. And because there was an announcement of Christ, there was then an accumulation of a crowd. People came from far and wide and filled that house to capacity so you couldn't squeeze another one in any other way. They were surrounding the house to see if they could catch a glimpse or hear a word of what the Lord Jesus had to say. Now I believe we could see this auditorium filled this week as well. If there's first of all an announcement of Christ, if you'll let your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, and your, your ball team mates and, and, and the parents of your kids' uh, ball team mates you know, know about the special meetings this week, if you'll be enthusiastic, if you'll be excited, if you'll be everything but obnoxious, I believe you might be able to see a friend or a neighbor, one or two or more, that would come to the services this week. Some of you say, it's just so hard to do that. Look, there are folks that can do that. There are folks that are able to do that because of their enthusiasm and their excitement, and God has blessed that for them. Earlier this year, year we were in a church uh, up in Pennsylvania, and uh, the three people who got the chalk drawings were in order of uh, first place, second place, and third place, and how many they brought. First place was 36 visitors, second place was 26 visitors, and third place was 24. Now those are different people in the churches, different families in the churches, but they were enthusiastic. They were excited. They took it seriously. They went after everybody they could, and they were able to get them to come. Look, uh, if you don't invite anybody to come this week, I assure you, you'll reach your goal. Nobody will, <laughs> okay? 
But if you'll invite everybody you can, you might be surprised, you might be shocked at who might show up at one of the services and might hear the gospel and might even be saved. I was preaching in Absecon, New Jersey a number of years ago. There was a lady who had been saved when we preached in that church three years before. At the time she got saved, she was a card dealer in one of the casinos in Atlantic City. And when she heard, the, uh, since that time actually, after we left there after that first meeting when she was saved, between there and the next time we came back, she had left that job because she knew that wasn't a place a Christian should be working. And God had given her another job where, where she was making more money and not having to do anything that wasn't pleasing to the Lord. And so, uh, but when she found out we were coming back again for another week of revival meeting, she went back to the casino one day and invited her former boss and a number of the other car dealers she used to work with to come to the special meetings. On the first Sunday morning of that week of revival meetings, there, <laughs> the, her former boss came and sat with her in a row. He heard the gospel message that morning. He raised his hand for prayer and the invitation that he did not know he was saved and would like to know. And when the invitation was given, he stepped out of his seat and he walked the aisle that morning and he accepted Christ as his Savior. He came back that night and brought the rest of his family with him. And that night, all of his family members also walked the aisle and they too accepted Christ as their personal Savior. For the rest of the week, that, that family and that lady who invited them to start with were always late coming into church. Not because they weren't at the church on time themselves, but because they were at the door of the lobby waiting for all the other people they had invited to join them there. Every night there was Casino Row. There must have been nine or ten different casino workers with them in their seats. And out of nine people who trusted Christ, as, uh, excuse me, 14 people who trusted Christ that week, nine of them were people they brought. And I asked her, I said, hey, listen, I have people tell me all the time, it is so hard to get people to come to the services. Uh, how did you do it? She said, are you kidding? She said, my boss and I are just so excited and thrilled about what God has done for us that we told him, hey, you got to come. You have to hear this. It'll change your life like it has ours. And they came. So let me encourage you. Be enthusiastic. Be excited. Be everything but obnoxious that we said a moment ago. And invite everyone you can, and you might be surprised at who will come and be with you in the special meetings and whose heart God may speak to. So that's why there was a packed house in this passage of Scripture. Let there be an announcement of Christ, and there can be an accumulation of a crowd. Notice the second thing. There was the preaching of the Word. Verse 2 continued, And he, that's the Lord Jesus, preached the Word unto them. Now, when Jesus had hungry men there, he always gave them what they needed most, and that was heavenly manna. When there were people who were searching and looking for answers, had needs in their spiritual lives, the Lord Jesus gave them what every person needs, and that is, that is the preaching of the Word of God and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave them his Word, and I, I want you to realize that this week, I, I, wanna, I want you to understand that any visitor you get to come will not hear the opinion of Evangelist Barry Webb, or for that matter, the opinion of Hanover Baptist Church, what they will hear, however, is the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. I try to fill every message I can with as much of the Scripture as I can. I was preaching in one church, and a fellow came to me after the service was over one night. He said, Brother Webb, I noticed you quote a lot of Scripture when you preach. He said, I started making a notch on my church bulletin every time you quoted another one. He said, I stopped counting tonight after you passed 40. There was a young teenager in a church a few uh, years ago who, after he heard me say that, decided to count himself one night, and he told me afterwards, Brother Webb, you were over 80 tonight. That way. Well, I'm not patting Barry Webb on the back when I say that. I just want every person to know any friend or neighbor or visitor you get to come is going to hear God's Word. It's not my opinion or the opinion of the church or even Pastor McAvoy that is going to carry any weight for eternity in anybody's life, but that is the work of the Word of God by the Spirit of God in people's hearts. So there's the preaching of the Word. Notice thirdly the palsied man. Verse 3 says, They come unto him bringing one sick of the palsy which was born of four. And we don't know a lot about this man, but we do know that, number one, he was hurting. He had a disease called palsy that had ruined his life, and he was helpless. There was un wasn't a thing he could do to get rid of that disease. No doctor could help him. No exercise plan would help him. No dietary change would, would get rid of the disease. He, he, he was hurting, and he was helpless. And he's a picture of, of every one of us born into the world as well, because we're all born with a disease the Bible calls sin. We can thank our human parents, Adam and Eve, for that. Romans 5, verse 12 says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The Bible tells us we're all born with sin. We're all born in bondage to sin, and there's nothing that we can do to get rid of that sin either. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, By grace are you saved through faith, and it not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So like the palsied man, we're hurting and we're helpless. But notice the next thing in our story is number four, the party of friends. The party of friends. Verse 3, And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Now again, we don't know a whole lot about these four. Uh, we don't know whether any were family members, were any next door neighbors to him. But we do know two things about these four. Number one, they were caring friends. 
They saw someone with a need that needed to get to the Lord Jesus Christ and they were concerned enough about that person to then be also not only a caring friend, but a carrying friend. They didn't just see him and say, that guy needs to get to some help or he needs to get to the Lord Jesus. They said, how can we get him to the Lord Jesus Christ? And so they worked together uh, to, to bring that man to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and you know, that's the way we ought to be as well. I, I, have, I was in a church once in Pennsylvania that had as the slogan on their church, uh, on, their, on their back of their wall in the church and on their literature and on the sign out front, the church with a heart, which I expect meant that they loved the lost around them and wanted to see people saved. But it was interesting that I had my hair cut in a barber shop two blocks from that church that week when I was there. And the barber had, had had his shop on that corner for years and had grown up in that community all of his life and didn't even know that church existed. No one from it had ever invited him to a service. Nobody had ever given him a gospel tract and asked him to read it. They said they cared, but when it came to actual practice, did they? You know, I contrast that with the church that I was in in eastern North Carolina when after the service was over one night, the pastor's married son and I went out to a Subway sandwich shop to pick up some food to bring back to the church so we could fellowship a bit. And when we walked into the restaurant, the pastor's son immediately walked over and handed the, ca the cashier, uh, the employee there, a, a flyer about the revival meeting and a gospel track and invited him to come. And after the uh, food had been prepared and put in the bags for us and he paid for it, he, he said to uh, the pastor's son, the, the worker did, he said, what church is that again? And when the pastor's son told him, he said, you know what? I have lived in seven different places in this county growing up. And people from that church have knocked on my door at every one. And the pastor's son said, that's the best news I've heard all day. Hey, listen, are you a caring friend? Are you concerned enough to be a carrying friend? Because there are some folks that even if you invite them, aren't going to come unless perhaps you go by and pick them up or provide a ride for them or some such thing. And some people say, well, wait a minute, that's going to cost me. Uh, so, well, look, it cost these fellows some time and who knows, work time maybe. It would have cost them money if they were supposed to be working at the time or whatever. But they were willing to invest their time and their talents and what they had to be able to get this man to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ought to be the same way as well. I found out a long time ago, folks, that anything that you expend or invest in the work of the Lord and reaching people with the gospel is always blessed by God and repaid by God. So don't be afraid to put that investment into the work of the Lord. Well, if I have to go pick somebody up, Brother Webb, I'm going to have to drive out of my way. It's going to take extra fuel. That's going to cost me more money. How would you like to pull a 40-foot fifth wheel around the countryside with a 6.7 liter turbo diesel engine? I learned a long time ago, God takes care of those kind of things. When you take care of His work, when you're being used of Him to bring others to the Lord Jesus Christ, God will bless you. Be a caring friend. Be a carrying friend as well. But look, the next thing we find is the problem of obstacles. Verse 4 says, when they could not come nigh in Him for the press. And verse 2 already told us that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. So what kind of obstacles stood in the way of their getting this man to Jesus? Well, there was something. There was a house with walls and doors and ceilings. You can't just walk through solid objects. And, and there was a crowd of newspaper reporters, right? It says the press. Were they the fake news or the real news or whatever kind of, we don't know. Anyway, the Bible tells us there were so many people around that house. Ever been trying to get into a venue everybody else was trying to get into and you just wanted to scoot up and fill in a little spot to be closer and somebody slapped you down, hey, get back there, you're not getting past me. Think about how hard it would have been these fellows carrying a guy on a bed trying to do that. And so they had obstacles. I can tell you this, that there will be something the devil will try to use this week to keep you home. You'll get a flat tire with your car, you'll get your water pump at your house will break down. Your boss who never asked you to work overtime before will ask you to do it this week. Or there'll be someone that may get in the way. The devil himself doesn't want you to be here, I can tell you that. But you may have a friend stop by you haven't seen for years just when it was time for you to leave for church and you'll be tempted to stay home and catch up with them when instead you should say, hey, it's providential. You showed up right now. We're just getting ready to go to a special meeting at our church. Why don't you come with us? And then we can fellowship afterwards or something that way. Uh, don't let someone or something get in the way. There will be something. Even the Apostle Paul said in his ministry, a great door and effectual is open unto me and there are many adversaries. Paul had lots of obstacles in trying to do the work of the Lord as well. But notice what happened in this passage. There's number six, the, the power of faith. The power of faith. What does it say next in this passage? Well, look at verse four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they gave up and went home. No, 
They uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed where in the sick of the palsy lay. These fellows would not take no for an answer. Somebody said, well, wait a minute, there's nobody on the roof. And somebody said, how's that going to help? And the other one said, well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's probably a tile ceiling. Most of the houses around here are, and we can go up on the roof and uh, find where Jesus is below, and we'll just take the grinding away from the tiling, and we can take out those tiles and put them back in later, but we can tie ropes to the, our friend's bed and lower him down into the presence right there where Jesus is. So that's exactly what they did. They went up on the roof, they removed the tiles, and they lowered their friend down. It's one time I tell folks it's perfectly fine to let your friend down. What did the power of their faith do? Two things. It overcame the obstacles and opened an opportunity to get the friend of Jesus. I remember somebody that told me, I invited somebody to come and they said, well, look, by the time I get, get, go fight through the traffic on the way home from work, I live on the other side of town from you and I get some food and I get changed and I get cleaned up and I try to fight my way back through the traffic to your church and your service is going to be halfway over anyway and so I'm not going to come in in the middle of the service like that. So thanks for the invitation, but no thanks, I won't be able to come. And that person said, you know what, I expected you might say, say that, so I'm inviting you over to my house for one night for, uh, after work for, serve, for dinner. You can come and eat dinner at our place. You'll be on the right side of town. You can change clothes there and we can go to the service. Or, or uh, you know, I heard somebody else told me they invited that person out to eat at a restaurant or whatever and said, okay, I'll take care of your meal. We'll be on the right side of town. And because of that, that person was able to come to the service. There, there, there's a way to get around the obstacles that the devil wants to put in your way if you'll look carefully for that and expect the power of God to work. So the power of their faith overcame the obstacles and opened an opportunity to get their friend to Christ. And that led to, number seven, the proclamation of forgiveness. Verse five, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. That is an extraordinary verse. It doesn't say when Jesus saw just his faith. And now why was this man forgiven of his sins? Well, first of all, in recognition of his faith, that nobody ever has been saved, is saved, or ever will be saved without having a personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't get to heaven on your parents' faith. You can't get to heaven on your pastor's faith or your prince, Christian school principal's faith. It has to be a personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But with a heart man believeth unto righteousness, with a mouth confession of men into salvation. So it's a personal decision every person has to make for themselves. So he was forgiven in recognition of, of faith, whose faith, his own faith. But notice the verse doesn't say when Jesus saw his faith. It says when Jesus saw their faith. So not only was it in recognition of his faith, but it was in response to faith. Whose faith? The faith of four fellows that had labored so hard to get that man to Jesus and had torn up a ceiling and had lowered him into the presence of Christ. Jesus looked up at those four faces looking at him pleading for the help of their friend. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man that was sick of the palsy, son, thy sins be forgiven you. I was preaching in a church in South Central Pennsylvania. A 12-year-old boy got saved on the first Sunday morning. Came by me at the door on the way out, shook my hand, said, guess what, Brother Webb? I said, what? He said, I got saved today. I said, that's wonderful. He said, guess what else? I said, what else? He said, I'm going home this afternoon. I'm going to invite my cousin to come with me tonight. He said, my cousin's going to come tonight, and my cousin's going to get saved. I thought, well, amen. Out the door he went. When he came back that night, guess who was with him? His cousin. And so he sat with his cousin in the second row. He shared his Bible with his cousin because he didn't have one. And in the invitation, his cousin raised his hand that he didn't know he was saved. And so he invited his cousin to come forward and get saved. And he came forward with his cousin to help him to do that. And, and his cousin got saved. And when the service was over, they both went by me at the door. And he shook my hand with an even bigger smile as he said, See, Brother Webb, I told you I was going to come back tonight. I told you I was going to bring my cousin. And I told you he was going to get saved. Look, God honors that kind of faith. So who do you know that you'd love to see come to know Christ as Savior? Who is your heart burdened toward? What kind of faith do you have regarding them as well? Because it says when Jesus saw their faith. But notice the last things I want you to see. This one I hate to bring up, but it's here, so we'll mention it on the way by. The pride of the scribes. Verses 6 and 7. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there reasoning in their hearts. Why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Now what characteristics did the scribes have? Well, they were unconcerned, right? Don't you suppose they knew a few people who needed to get to Jesus as well? I mean, they probably worked at the temple. They went back and forth, these people at the gate that were begging and, and, and asking for help all the time, laid on sick beds and past the pool of Bethesda on your way to the temple the other way where all those people were laying, you know. I mean, there were lots of people that they do, I'm sure, that needed to get to the Lord Jesus Christ.
but they didn't bother to be concerned about them. They were unconcerned. And not only that, they were uncomprehending. Now think about it. Of all the people who were there in that house that day who should have known who Jesus was, it should have been them. They were the keepers and the copiers of the scriptures. Remember this Christmas story, Matthew chapter 2, when the wise men came from the east of Jerusalem and said to, to, uh, to Herod the king, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Whom did Herod call to get that information? And when he had called the chief priests and the scribes, same people, other people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Did they know? Well, they didn't have it right off the bat, but they knew where to find it. And they looked it up and they came back and they said to him, Now Bethlehem in the land of Judah, not the least among the princes of Judah, out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. But even though they knew exactly where the Messiah was to be born, do you read about any of them attaching themselves to the group of the wise men and going to see the Messiah for whom they should have been waiting all these years? No. Didn't fit their narrative. Didn't have to do with what they were interested in in their lives. Don't be like the scribes. Some people are like that. You know, you've heard the statement, the light's on but nobody's home. I see that sometimes in church pews. People come in and they sit down and nestle into the corner of their pew for a quiet doze. No, don't, don't be like the scribes and the Pharisees, unconcerned or uncomprehending. Look at the last thing I want you to see before we close. And that's the proof of forgiveness. The proof of forgiveness. It says in verse 8, And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason to these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to, easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. What then is the first proof of this man's forgiveness? I emphasized some words as I read the verses. You should have gotten an idea. What did he say? So that you may know I what? I say. First proof of the man's forgiveness was the word. The word of the Lord. He said, so that you may know that I have power on earth to forgive sins. I say to that man. And he turned to the man and said, Sir, son, I say unto you, Arise and take up your bed and walk. And so the first proof of forgiveness was the word. Praise God, if you've accepted Christ as Savior, the Bible is your birth certificate. It tells you that that is what saves you if you put your trust in Christ and how you have been saved and that you are saved and kept by the power of God as well. But, but what, what else was it that made the, that was what made the religious leaders perk up their ears and begin to question. What was it that made everybody else, it says, become amazed and glorified God and say, we've never seen it on this fashion. What caused them to say that? Well, the Bible says it was the walk. The fact that a man who couldn't even get there under his own power got up off the bed, rolled it up, and walked out through a crowd he could not even walk in through. It was his changed life that was proof of the person and power of Jesus Christ. And if you've invited very many people to come to church, I guarantee you're going to run into somebody who's going to say, I'm not interested. Why? Church is full of... Oh, you've heard that before. The problem is, too often it's true. If the neighbors can hear your car coming three blocks away, ba boom, ba boom, ta twang, 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 like you can hear them, or, or they hear you, uh, the man, and the music blares out of your house in the summertime when the windows open, or they hear you yelling at your kids through the windows and all the rest of that, or the kids getting mad and stomping out of the house and squealing their car tires down the road, or they see you partying in the backyard, you know, drinking, social drinking, and slugging back another brew or something else that way. Why do they need your Jesus? Because your life is no different than theirs. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And the world expects to see that. God does too, because he's the one that makes that change if we have genuine salvation. The word is going to be proof of his power and his person, and the walk with him is going to be proof of his power and person as well. We not only need to declare the gospel with our lips as we should this week, but we need to demonstrate it with our lives as well. And God will use us to be bringing others to the Lord. So let's bow in a closing word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this scripture that gives us this wonderful story of these men who were laboring because they they saw someone who needed to get to Christ, and they, they knew that they could be used to get him there. And Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us to be alert to the divine appointments that you have for us as well, that we might be aware of those around us that we can invite and get to come that need to hear the gospel and need their spiritual needs met. And we pray, Lord, that you would make them disposed to come as they're invited. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.